Electricast. Hold on to your butt. Come on, sucker. Let's get it on. Oh, you want to fight? You want to fight? Now, do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. You don't know anybody named Iris? I don't know nobody named Iris. Can I have a piece of toast? I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Western demands. How could you do this to me? Really, I want to know. Why did you do that? What you feel only matters to you. Step back for one minute and look at the big picture. And that's all. No, no, not for the real fire. We often bond a family that very few can understand. Help me! Help you. <laughs> I don't do drugs. Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host Iris and I'm here with my older brother. Wesley. And today we're discussing the 1991 classic surf movie Johnny Utah. It was originally entitled Johnny Utah and then it was renamed Riders on the Storm. Until ultimately settling, because those other two movies had, had no connection with surfing, to Point Break. Which means what? You know, not being a surfer, I'm not entirely sure. The best <laughs> I can determine is that when the water comes up, when the, the tide comes up against the rock, that is the point over which the wave forms and breaks over the rock. There are many kinds of breaks. There are rock breaks, sand breaks, coral breaks, and they all have different levels of intensity or severity of the wave, gentle swells versus raging crashers. You have no idea what you're talking about. It's the point at which the wave forms because of an underlying feature, be it just the sand sloping up or coral or rocks. And subtextually, does it refer to the point at which Johnny Utah throws away his FBI badge? It's the breaking point when he breaks the case. I think you crack cases. You, <laughs> and thus they're broken. <laughs> Speaking of the ending, when he throws away the badge, that's just badass, right? Yeah, that's badass planning. But why? Why does he throw away the badge? It's symbolic. He's submitting his life to the sea. He's surrendering his badge. See, you watch movies and stuff, and you watch cop movies, but you don't get the spiritual side of it. Point Break is about the experience. It's the ultimate rush. Who are you, Patrick Swayze? All you gotta do is jump. Thanks, Bodie. <laughs> I justified in my mind him throwing away the badge because he's Keanu Reeves and I can justify anything that he does. And to me, it was he, you know, he was a football star and like he endures the rigors of law school and now he's a white collar FBI agent and he is all boxed in and then he finishes his case and now he feels that he can let go of that structure and that he was changed by Bodhi. Yeah, a little bit late though. He's already 25 and just now he's going to take up surfing. <laughs> It's never too late, bro. So Catherine Bigelow directed this movie, and do you know who she was married to at the time? Only executive producer James Cameron. And apparently, although he wasn't listed as such because of a WGA dispute, he was a co-writer, especially for the final draft, along with Catherine Bigelow. So they were a married filmmaking team at that point, and we know how much James Cameron loves to throw crap into the ocean at the end of his movies. <laughs> FBI badge being slightly less valuable than the heart of the ocean, but yeah. That's it. That's the only thread I had for that. Oh, that's what you got. All right. Not to say that Catherine Bigelow doesn't do things big. Obviously, she does. And I don't know that she took all her cues from James Cameron. I'm not suggesting that. But it does have a, an epic kind of feel to me. They certainly try to make it feel epic with the skydiving scene, the surf video sequences. Yeah, it's not a little surf movie is all I'm saying. Are you saying that maybe it feels big because it's so testosterone driven? Maybe. This is a dude movie. A dude movie helmed by a lady. Is this how ladies break into the industry by making dude movies? I don't know. She did Blue Steel before this. She went on, of course, and this Point Break was her highest grossing movie. Uh, she also did Near Dark, but uh, her highest grossing movie until she did Zero Dark Thirty. I hadn't seen Point Break prior to reviewing it. Ever? Prior to previewing it for this review. I don't think so. Wow. And Brian hadn't seen it for like 20 years. He's like, I remember this movie being like the best movie ever. And I could see why. For 1991, it's like a perfect action movie with all the testosterone and the smart aleck lines. Is that smart aleck or smart ass? Smart aleck. It's both. 
Oh. Point Break is the top gun in of the ocean. I feel like this is a very Southern California movie. Not just the scenery, the locations, the surfing, because obviously they weren't skydiving at the beach or anything, but still him infiltrating the California beach bum lifestyle and yeah. Utah searching out the Tyler character and her kind of scummy cutoffs, no underwear, everyone riding around in dirty convertibles kind of movie. <laughs> Well, they skydived at the desert, which is also very Californian. You can be at the beach in the morning and snowboarding in the afternoon or skydiving in the desert. That's the California adventure lifestyle. Yeah, and I think the sequel, the Point Break remake, they covered all the other elements. Wing suiting and all the other, and dirt biking and all the other extreme sports, X game style sports that this one didn't touch on. Was the 2015 version like a straight up remake? So it was a remake, yes, but with more extreme sports. And as far as I remember, a lot less surfing. So I wanted to watch this because of the Keanu Sants, and I was really feeling his Johnny Utah. He was almost perfectly cast for this movie. Like he's tall and brawny and totally has a football quarterback physique. I don't know that I necessarily buy him as like a law school grad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, he is, he's deceptively sharp and maybe, you know, kind of street smarty. But he's got the California vibe. Like when he wants to go all Ted Theodore Logan, then he can pull it out and be like, yeah, bro, let's like catch that wave, yo. Yeah, you got a sucker like crawling in your ear. Close one, bro. Is that, uh, did you did the air quotes when you said Ted Theodore Logan? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is, maybe this is Keanu Reeves' optimal cutie pieness. Because he definitely gets beefier, super buff in speed three years later, less cutie pie hair. But this is maybe the pinnacle. This is your personal Keanu Sans, but this is his initial wave pun intended, of success. This is the golden decade, the golden years for Keanu Reeves, right? Point Break It in 91 was actually his first action-style movie. After the Art House Fair, the Gus Van Sant, My Own Private Idaho, and, and Bill and Ted stuff, he did this, and then he followed it up with Speed, and ultimately he capped off this decade of the 90s with The Matrix. Was this also the golden age of movies for Anthony Kiedis? <laughs> I guess, being that I think this is maybe his only movie. <laughs> And, uh, and didn't do all that well in this movie, I guess. I think he looked in place. He went all flea in this movie. How do you go from Anthony Keyes to flea? What's the difference? Like he was all dirty and shaved heady and strung out looking. Was it, was Brian excited? Anthony Kiedis is his boy. <laughs> he kept on asking me, is that Anthony Kiedis? <laughs> Apparently, Anthony Kiedis wanted to be in this movie really badly, but not enough so that he would show up for the fight training. They had a fight choreographer for that scene, and everybody showed up and got ready except for Anthony Kiedis. So on the day that he showed up to film the fight, the stunt coordinator and stuff made sure that he got knocked out with one punch and was immediately put out of the fight. And then we get to see him shoot, literally shoot himself in the foot later on in the movie. So, so much for Anthony yeah. Kiedis' action roles. So he got what was coming to him? I guess so. You know who did not get what was coming to him? Who that? War Child? <laughs> the stunt FBI man who dives into the kitchen and knocks his chin on the counter. <laughs> did you see that? That was during the house infiltration when they when they, yes. they bust into Bunker's house? Yeah. Yeah, they're I don't know who they're tackling, but some stunt man face planted into a counter and it was real. It was like legit. And I was like, ooh, but you gotta keep that in, right? Yep. Oh, for sure. Go for it scenes where people are fighting and people are naked and they're screaming and people getting blown away and stuff. Yeah, the naked wiki chick was like nuts. She was like horror movie nuts. Right. <laughs> Stabbing people on the back and stuff. I have a suspicion that uh, they were filming that movie and they like asked some real tweakers if they could use their like coke house or whatever, their flop house. And Tom Sizemore happened to literally be there in the corner. And he's like, hey, I'm an actor. And they're like, yeah, dude, give him some lines. That poor dude suffered a lot of problems. And so I felt like, oh, this is kind of the role for Tom Sizemore. Is he in this movie? Yeah, he was the guy that was undercover and uh, had to get a tattoo uh, after immersing himself oh. in beach thug life for two years undercover just to have Utah and co. blow the operation. He's flown under my radar. Brian pointed him out in Saving Private Ryan. We were watching that recently. 
Did you know that Steven Spielberg had him take a drug test every day and had a zero tolerance policy that if he ever came up positive that he was going to be off the picture? Yeah, regardless of how much they had filmed. Regardless of how much they filmed or how much he was in the scene? He was a major role. He was Horvath and he was in the whole thing. And Steven Spielberg still said, if you screw up, you're out of here and I'll bring in someone new. Uh, It makes sense. The thing with Point Break and its dude moviness is that in 1991, the sentiment when things didn't make sense was, it's just a movie. Some logical non-cause and effect thing. And then somebody would say, it's just a movie. And that was the attitude toward movies. They weren't expected to be real. And I felt like there were a lot of plot holes in this movie. And I'm wondering if this movie came out in a time when people would have said, it doesn't really matter. What I'm, and, the, and Tom Sizemore makes me think about this because we knew from the beginning that it's Patrick Swayze. So why do we have to go through all the motions of the misdirect with the clown surfer dudes and Tom Sizemore's uh, undercover operation and whatever that Johnny Utah and Gary Busey mess up? Well, because they were still on the trail of the surfers at the time. A, we need to see crazy chicks and thongs stab people. B, and uh, we na- we need to see the people throw down. They were the dark side of the surf culture, I guess. I don't know. I felt like it was meant to infuse the reality of they're not just fun, lovable bad guys, but actual criminals. And he was actually an FBI agent and not just like, yeah, I'm a surfer, but also a cop. You can't not do it without the Keanu voice. Yeah. Uh, The sneak says I do a terrible Keanu Reeves. I think I do it pretty good. Uh, You do it really great when you do, whoa. Whoa. So you're saying that this movie is a not so realistic, trying to be realistic action movie? (laughs) Yeah. And the major set pieces, which are really cool, are not really plot or story justified. Like skydiving, not justified. Just kind of cool and and a really great opportunity for Johnny Utah to show us how big his balls are. (laughs) More, I think more Bodie. Well, Bodie's not the one who jumps out of the plane without the pack. Yeah, it's only Johnny Utah and Travis Pastrana who would do such a thing. Has Travis Pastrana done that? Yes, on behalf of Red Bull. He jumped out uh, with no shirt on. I think he was chugging a Red Bull as he jumped. And then everyone jumped with him and hooked him up to them so that he jumped out of the plane with no parachute and then latched onto another guy with a parachute to land. Whoa. But I mean, I think this movie heralded the beginning of the extreme sports craze, and ultimate, which ultimately resulted in the X Games and Red Bull sponsorships and all the kind of stuff that led and allowed for Travis Pastrana to do what he does. Brian was like, I wonder if this movie did for surfing what Karate Kid did for karate. Yeah, I think so. A lot of people are definitely surfers, maybe the sneak included, because of Point Break. Did you know that the night football scene with Johnny Utah, where he tackled Bodie and sent him into the waves and they had a big dust up, was also the same beach as the soccer scene in the Karate Kid at the beginning? Karate Kid, well, you know, all the beach. There are easier beaches to shoot on in Los Angeles than others, so I'm not surprised that they would share a common location. How happy do you think the sneak was that the line he gave to Tyler in the surf sandwich shop or whatever was that he's a dude who wants to learn how to surf who just landed here from Ohio? Like he's her dream dude? You know it. She's going to be so excited when she sees this review land on the website. I love when she was like, shrimp and fries, to go. Like she just added it in. And when they woke up on the beach, I was like, what a movie moment. They are selling these Ohioans who are dreaming about this California lifestyle so hard because you don't sleep comfortably on the beach. In fact, you sleep horribly on the beach and you wake up freezing and wet. It was almost as unrealistic as what I consider to be the most egregious day for night seen in the history of cinema, where there's supposed oh, the to be surfing. night surfing and you can literally see the sun. <laughs> Yeah, but how else are you going to shoot it? I don't know. But to contrast that with them playing football on the beach where the ocean is as black as can be and then they're out there surfing and it's all glorious and bathed in light. Life is hard, but finding a really great podcast makes the days go by so much easier. Hi, my name is Blue Toulousma. I'm a writer, an emotional intelligence coach, and the host of Humanize with Blue Toulousma, a podcast where we believe that when you humanize everyone in the room, a great conversation is almost guaranteed. 
Join us every week here on ElectroCast as me and my guest co-hosts unpack big topics and interview even bigger personalities with a sense of humor and a dash of mischief. If you're looking for a new best friend in your head, we've got you covered. ElectroCast. You know who gets the 1991 award for best 90s actor in this movie? Who's that? John C. McGinley. Yeah, man. And as much as it's, I love John C. McGinley in this role and in Office Space, which wasn't too much later, um, I definitely thought that you weren't going to say him for the prototypical actor like this for the 90s. Who were you going to give it to? I thought you were going with Gary Busey in his, what I consider to be his last sane performance. Yeah, and the last time he kind of looked normal. So I looked it up in his motorcycle accident, which caused permanent brain damage. That motorcycle accident was three years before this movie, so he was already messed up. It was actually encouraging to see him be so capable in this movie, where he's like, wahoo, and he's running around and jumping in the pool and and chasing people and gunfights and stuff. It's kind of sad, because, I mean, he had a bad, like a brain damage, like fell off his motorcycle, slid across the street, and slammed his head into the curb kind of accident. Well, Pappas was certainly dedicated to this case, and he saw it through, but his death was really unnecessary. Yeah, it's hard to see him go so far to die so unceremoniously. Yeah, and he fed off of Johnny Utah's kind of impulsiveness, and he was like, yeah, like, let's go get them. Like, I'm not going to turn you in. Let's just go rogue, go cowboy, and, like, get these guys ourselves. And at that point, everything was just led by Johnny Utah's impulsiveness. And I felt like the character suffered for it. Like it made him less of a likable dude that he just became so obsessed with Tyler and his and how personally he was tangled up with this gang. The moment he blows his cover in the chase scene with Bodhi, he goes rogue and he becomes dangerous to the people around him. But talk about impractical or unreal. Bodhi forces him to go rob the bank with them. Like, there's got to be easier ways to get away with bank robbery than to go through the trouble of dragging along the wild card who's got a personal vendetta against you and making him rob a bank with you. He was trying to incriminate him, I think. But all the stuff that Johnny Utah ends up doing in this movie, all of it is against his will. He learns to surf because he has to to get close to the ex-president. He's forced to rob the bank. He's forced to skydive. He doesn't want to do any of it. Well, he's not the instigator, but he does. He's 100% complicit. And it's very stressful because we know that Bodhi's onto him at that point. Wakes him up in the morning before he has a chance to literally arm himself and drags him off to jump out of an airplane. Yeah, why are they both playing around with that? They both know the covers are blown. They're playing the cat and mouse game. Speaking of a cat and mouse game, when his cover is blown and they're having the foot chase and Utah is unmasked, but Bodhi is still masked running around and throwing pit bulls at him and running through people's backyards, Ferris Bueller style and stuff. Yeah. That wasn't Patrick Swayze at all. Well, of course not. At all. I have to think that he was on the mask for the soulful looking back when he sees Utah has hurt himself and decided not to fire yes, on him. Yes, 100%. Because those were the Patrick Swayze soulful eyes, the dirty yes. dancing eyes. It's not that he didn't want to uh, or that he wasn't prepared to, but he was in Europe promoting Ghost. I thought as much. It made sense. Like, if Patrick Swayze could be spared it, why not? But it did make me feel for... Keanu Reeves, who who looked like he did almost all of it, including a couple spills. Yeah, Patrick Swayze was certainly no slouch, but a lot of them did their a lot of their own stunt work in this movie. She wanted it to feel very real and grounded, uh, ironically, because you're saying that a lot of it isn't real and grounded, particularly when Patrick Swayze is trying to shoot people uh, with the uh, on-fire gas nozzle, his uh, improvised flamethrower. That seemed really dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Like, don't you just spray the gasoline and then light it on fire? You don't light the gas pump? I don't know if it can be done. I don't know if he had done it before. What I do know is that that scene was took place at the gas station just off PCH at Barrel, like two blocks from where I used to live, right in Redondo Beach. That gas station is no longer there. It's like a little auto shop now. I didn't feel like for a L.A. movie, a, a specifically L.A. beach movie, that they used a lot of L.A. landmarks. That's why I feel like it's not a Hollywood conventional, look, we're in L.A., dude. But for the people who live in L.A., it definitely feels like L.A. to me. You can say, oh, that's Manhattan Beach and they're on the pier and they're, at, you know, they're at Patrick's Roadhouse. All of those places track for me. It feels like L.A. because for those landmarks, uh, L.A. residents wouldn't typically hang out there anyway. 
We didn't mention that Point Break from 1991 is available now on HBO Max. Definitely a cult classic movie now. Man, that Patrick Swayze hair is like, that should be cold haircut. Yeah, but I felt like it wasn't cool hair. It was like the death gasp of the mullet. <laughs> that little cut bangs to frame his face kind of thing bugs me. It was the surfer fringe. That, Nobody that else had that haircut. They were all blonde and glowy and hairy. Yeah, but they didn't have the little bangs. Uh, I thought he looked great. He looked the part. He was like tan, toned, blonde. Both Keanu Reeves and Patrick Swayze that year were nominated for MTV Movie Awards for Most Desirable Male. They were up against each other in that role. And who prevailed? You know who prevailed. Patrick Swayze was like 50. <laughs> In this movie? No way. He definitely looked sundog weathered. I mean, don't get me wrong. That dude can beat my ass, and he was all buff and, and athletic and really jumping out of planes and doing flippies in the air and stuff, but he didn't look 25 like Johnny Utah. He was the bodhisattva. He was wizened. Most desirable male. Yep. And as much as I felt like Bodhi had dumb hair and was just a little bit old for this role, maybe he was more established... Uh, Patrick Swayze, definitely the most athletic. He knew how to surf. Maybe he wasn't a world-class surfer because he had a surf double. He definitely skydived a bunch of times. He did like 50 jumps for this movie alone. And the scene where he says, adios amigo, and jumps out of the plane was the actual take. They did ADR, you know, because you can't hear in that setting. But then he jumped out of that airplane on camera, which must have been an insurance nightmare. But from what I understand, Keanu Reeves didn't know how to surf at all. Had to go through a surfing boot camp along with Lori Petty in Hawaii because Lori Petty, sources have it, had never set foot in the ocean in her life before this movie. I feel like this movie, I don't know that it would stand out today. That was the thing. We watched Point Break after having watched Mission Impossible Fallout. And the contrast just shows like how crazy extreme we are now. Ethan Hunt like crashes a helicopter into another helicopter. Yes, Tom Cruise, he learned how to do that crazy out of control spiral maneuver thing. No, he didn't. Talk about insurance nightmare. Yeah, but Tom Cruise is the producer of those movies. And he threatens if he's not allowed to do these stunts that he will walk away and they have to let him do it. That dude is crazy. It's actually the worst comparison to, to watch this in conjunction with a Mission Impossible movie because there's just no way it could stand up because no one is more Bodie in the world today than Tom Cruise. He's a real searcher. So Bodie and Utah just pale in comparison to Ethan Hunt. Yep. They're, but, but could you say they are precursors? To Ethan Hunt? Sure. But did you see how pale Keanu Reeves started out in this movie? And then by the time that Captain or whatever his name is is yelling at him, he's super tanned. I mean, I guess it would make sense. That's a pretty weak segue. Why does Utah bring a gazillion guys to Aust the, the beach in Australia and then doesn't use any of them? Because he intended to take him in. He handcuffed him and then they had, they had to fight. But ultimately, he knew that Bodhi couldn't live in a cage, I guess, and was... Going, it was all going to come out in the wash anyway, it, uh, pun intended. And that if he let him go, it would be the same thing as hauling him in. And also, again, you just, you just don't see the spiritual side to it. Enlighten me, old wise one. <laughs> you have to let Bodhi complete his circle of life. Doesn't the public deserve to see him pay for his crimes? No one cares. There was no public. <laughs> There was no, he, never he once did we cut to a news broadcast. There was no outside interference. It was the police versus the ex-presidents. And at no point was there any press about this. Well, what about that poor beat cop's wife and children? It's the only person, in fact, because as Bodhi said, he, he hates violence, man. And that cop is the only cop that Bodhi actually kills. Right. He just has his lapdog do all of his dirty work for him. Yeah, man. Rosie is scary. Yeah, Rosie. What a great name. They were all vaguely early 90s, late 80s, slightly feminine names for dudes, except for War Child. Oh, yeah, like Shannon or... Or, or Bodie or Johnny or Tyler or Roach. I think Point Break has its place as an early 90s action movie. It was a big movie, I think, and it, and it turned a lot of people on to the more extreme stunts. And there are definitely a lot of people that want to surf or want to skydive because of this movie. One of its strongest assets or one of its strongest benefits also was one of its biggest drawbacks. And that is that James Cameron, as executive producer uh, and co-writer on Point Break for his wife at the time, Catherine Bigelow, also, it turns out, 
is a movie producer and director, and also had another movie coming out in 1991, which in fact premiered one week ahead of Point Break, and then gave it a really, really hard run for its money in its second weekend. Terminator 2? Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Obviously regarded as an action classic, so Point Break may have gotten lost in the shuffle a little bit. Not quite terminated. Held its own for what it is, and definitely retained enough memory so that it became a cult movie with a cult following. She got him back with Hurt Locker. Yep. And now they're in those Rolex ads together. They're in Rolex ads together? Yeah, with like Martin Scorsese and other prominent film directors other prominent famous old people yeah rolex is going for the sophisticated angle of directors who kill hundreds of people in their movies well there's a pretty low body count the raid on the drug house was kind of bloody yep these fbi operations seemed really messy johnny utah was just off the charts rogue i can't believe they let him back in the bureau so that he could continue to pursue Bodhi. like was he not disciplined at all for having robbed the bank. He was just like given a passport and unlimited expense budget so he can go to Fiji and <laughs> Australia. Tyler, why was she so happy to see him? Well, because she wasn't dead. He's like, he's so dreamy next to Rosie and smells better. No, for reals. She was going to say something and then he uses her line on her. But what was she going to say? Like, thank you or I'm sorry. It seemed like she was going to say, I'm sorry. And for what? I'm not really sure because he did lie to her. He did deceive her. Dude, you've, he ever, you've never been abducted and held at knife point apparently and then rescued by Keanu Reeves. Fine. If you're unwilling to have this conversation with me and you are saying to me in your passive aggressive comments that this is just a movie, relax. Fine. <laughs> I mean, what do you got? How deep can we go into the character of Tyler? She was a broken woman who lost her parents at a tender age and found solace in the spiritual teachings of Bodhi and also found surfing. And and she was an independent woman who, in her own way, worked at her sandwich shop so that she could surf and live a surfing-type lifestyle until Johnny Utah came and shook it all up. But she didn't become an idiot because she was in love with Johnny. Yeah, she might have fallen a little hard, for him harder than she fell for Bodhi, according to Bodhi, but she was opening her heart up to someone who deceived her. Yes, but then she got kidnapped in an action movie, and when she was rescued, she was in a nightgown in the desert. Yeah, what was the little nighty for? Come on, dude, this is all, these were all problems for me. So you're saying that this didn't feel plausible all the way through for you, didn't hold up? Well, before you get all defensive, Point Break is a good movie. Well, yeah, so much so that they did it again. This exact same premise later on was recycled for what movie? Point Break? The Fast and the Furious, where the cop has to go undercover to infiltrate this extreme sports organization. And in the meantime, he meets the woman that leads him into this lifestyle that he falls for and ultimately has to choose between his love and this new world that he's found himself immersed in. What's going to happen? Whoa. I'm losing the accent. I'm a little bit alarmed because I had it so thoroughly and now it's gone. Whoa. It's almost back. Paul Walker was great. Also, maybe not capable of the range that the true greats could achieve. I would argue that Keanu Reeves has a hard time escaping Keanu Reeves, so you just embrace the Keanu Reeves. But Paul Walker kind of had a dumb guy voice too. It only recently became obvious to me that Keanu Reeves' dumbness just comes from his monotone delivery. Like, he is unable to use inflection to change his voice. Yeah, Kelly said, she's like, is that his real voice? And I was like, yeah, it's so it's so Keanu Reeves. It's just the Keanu Reeves voice that it's hard for me to conceive of anything different. Uh, Kevin Costner, well regarded as a more serious actor, suffers from the same problem. So what's your rating on Point Break? You caught me on a good day, and Point Break gets from me a totally shut up it is the quintessential fun action movie of the early 90s i really liked watching it and you just can't get around how fun it is keanu reeves is funny and cool and such a cutie pie and 
This is maybe Patrick Swayze in top form. I don't care about Dirty Dancing. Good to see Gary Busey. Nice to see Catherine Bigelow throwing down with the best of them, going up against uh, James Cameron, no small feat, and holding her own for a movie that endures throughout the ages. Damn thing, nearly 30 years old at this point. That's saying something. Yeah, it's got some holes. Yeah, it's got some cheese. But if you don't see it, if you don't like it, there's just a little bit less fun in your life, and therefore you should totally see it. Now I see why you were getting all defensive. This is one of your rare totally movies, and uh, you were getting a little butthurt that I was picking it apart. I was not. This is totally based on feeling. Is this a great movie? No, but it's definitely fun to watch and worth seeing for sure. Plot holes and all, this definitely is satisfying my need to continue on my journey through my Kianessance, and it was, I agree, a lot of fun. So that's our review on Point Break from 1991, available now on HBO Max. Let us know what you think about this action movie classic, 818-835-0473, or whatever movies at gmail.com, or whatever movies on Instagram and Twitter. We love to hear from you. We love to review your movie recommendations. So let us know what we can, uh, I don't know, do for you. Uh, so thanks for listening, and see you next time. Are you a fan of classic cinema or a young person who wants to discover the best films of all times? Do these legendary movies still hold up? On the Generation Film Podcast, two guys who grew up when movies dominated the culture share a great film with a panel of young movie lovers and see how it plays for today's generation. We discuss changes in storytelling, styles, representation, the making of each film, its initial reception, and how its meaning has changed over the years. Join us as we explore cinema classics across generations on Generation Film. Electric acid. Welcome to Sarah Talk Solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, you've tuned into a bit of a different type of show. I'm Sarah B and I'm your host. You can find me on my IG, which is Aussie underscore Sarah underscore LA. I talk about amazing, relevant conversations and topics and what functions that goes on in this magical, wonderful, wonderful city of the City of Angels. My IG, which is Aussie underscore Sarah underscore LA.